In this video, we're going to talk about the Avs, which are the birds. And to recap, remember that the amniotes are divided into synapsids and seropsids. And then the seropsids are further classified into the diapsids. And the diapsids is evolved into reptiles and birds. So you can see that the Archosauromorpha includes dinosaurs, alligators, crocodiles, and birds. So birds are actually considered a type of reptile, and they are really descended from dinosaurs. Looking at our classification for birds, they are in domain Eukarya, kingdom Animalia, phylum Chordata, and subphylum Vertebrata, and then more specifically, the class is the Aves. So if we look at our phylogenetic tree here, so we can see our birds, which are classified with reptilia. They are amniotes. They have four legs or limbs, so they are tetrapods. They breathe using lungs. They have a jaw. They have a vertebral column. They are chordates, and they are deuterostomes. Birds are endothermic, which means that they are able to regulate their own body temperature. We could also call them homeothermic because they maintain a homeostatic or a specific body temperature. So more commonly, this is referred to as warm-blooded, but the more scientific term is endothermic. Birds also have a really high metabolic rate. And remember, metabolism are just these chemical reactions that occur in the body. And more specifically, when we talk about metabolic rate, we're usually talking about the ability to extract energy from food. So flying requires a lot of energy. So birds have to be very efficient with regards to taking in nutrients and then quickly converting those nutrients into energy in the form of ATP. Some adaptations that help birds to fly. So they do have feathers, which are related to scales and hair, and they have that protein keratin in them. The feathers also aid in insulation. So it helps with that endothermy. It helps to trap heat and keep the bird warm. They also have hollow bones called pneumatic bones. And you can see that in this picture here. So this is a pneumatic bone. And you can see that it's got a lot of spaces in here. And so that helps to lighten the bones and make it so that they have less weight that they have to carry around while they're flying. They also have a sternum and a sternum, a sternum is just also known as a breastbone. That's in the shape of a keel, and a keel is kind of this, um, if you think about the bottom of a boat, like a sailboat especially, a keel is this kind of um, shape like this. And the sternum is the attachment point for their flight muscles, and so their breast muscles are the ones that are involved in flight. Another adaptation that helps them to fly is the ability to have efficient respiration. And this goes along with the high metabolic rate. So remember in cellular respiration, this is how organisms make ATP. And they have to have oxygen that goes into the reaction along with the nutrients such as glucose, which we can write as C6H12O6. And then they're able to extract energy to make ATP. And they also make some other stuff, including carbon dioxide and some water. So respiration in this case is just talking about the ability to exchange those gases with the organism and the environment. And it's interesting, they have what they 
what are called unidirectional lungs. So one way or one direction lungs. And what this does is it allows the deoxygenated and oxygenated blood to not mix with each other. Or really, I guess I should say the deoxygenated and oxygenated air does not mix with each other in the lungs. Whereas in humans, when we inhale air, it's actually mixing with some residual deoxygenated air that's already in our lungs. So we're less efficient than birds when it comes to gas exchange. So this ensures that the maximum amount of oxygen goes into the body and the maximum amount of carbon dioxide leaves the body. So that maximizes or increases the efficiency of making this energy. There's also countercurrent exchange between lungs and the pulmonary capillaries. So basically what that means is that you have a high concentration of, we'll say, oxygen flowing through the lungs in one direction. And then looking at the pulmonary capillaries, they would have a low amount of oxygen and a high amount of carbon dioxide. So we'll say lungs is high O2, low CO2. But in the pulmonary capillaries, you have high CO2 and low O2. And that makes the gas exchange more efficient. So you've got more oxygen flowing into the pulmonary capillaries where it's then going to get delivered to the rest of the body so that the cells can do cellular respiration and the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out into the lungs where it can then be exhaled. Birds also have a structure called a cloaca, and the cloaca is a single opening that is connected to the digestive, urinary, and genital or reproductive tracts. The cloaca is also associated with reptiles and monotremes. So remember, monotreme mammals are just the ones that lay eggs, for example, the platypus. And so essentially birds have one opening to get rid of waste products um, and also involved in copulation and laying eggs. Now, due to this, they do not have a urinary bladder. So with organisms like humans, we actually store our urine in a bladder until we go find a place to empty our bladders. But birds don't really have that option. They can't really hold on to that. And it's one reason why birds poop so much. Um, it's not even really poop. It's poop and pee and other stuff is all kind of mixed together. But this helps to reduce weight because remember, birds need to be able to fly around. And the less weight you have, the more efficiently you can fly. And so instead of storing these waste products, they just let them go in or out through this cloaca. It also makes them more efficient when it comes to water. So they are very efficient at reabsorbing water from their waste products. And that's why the material that comes out of the cloaca is a relatively small amount and it's pretty concentrated. It's not as liquidy as, for example, human urine. 